Hello, Helsinki. Hello, Hello the world. <laughs> okay, this is Almayo from Ethiopia. Um, you know, we, we, for those of you who don't know where Ethiopia is, it's located in the eastern part of Africa, normally uh, known as uh, the Horn of Africa. The Horn of Africa. And, uh, you know, I've, I have arrived here on Wednesday morning with a flight duration of seven years. <laughs> because when I was on board, it was 2012. By the time I've arrived here, it's already 2019. Do you know, do you know why? No, why? Because where I come from, uses a different calendar. <laughs> there, it's or still in 2012. So if you happen to come to Ethiopia, what would happen? You, you would be younger by seven years. <laughs> so that is, that is one unique, unique uh, thing about Ethiopia. The other unique thing is the land of origin. It's another nickname of Ethiopia. Why we call it Young of, uh, Land of Origin? Because the first Homo sapien was found in Ethiopia. Have you heard about Lucy? Yeah, the first Homo sapien found in Ethiopia. And another, another contribution from Ethiopia is coffee. Ethiopia is a motherland for coffee. Coffee is introduced or originated in the place known as Kaffa. Ethiopia contributed coffee for the rest of the world. If I talk one recent thing, our current prime minister won the 2019 Peace Nobel Prize. So, so much things happen in Ethiopia. Despite all these good things, in Ethiopia is one of the countries that has over 10 million people who cannot read and write. You know, the recent study showed that uh, there are over 4 million uh, kids, school age kids, who are out of school, who never been to school at all. So this is a very big number. So, um, of course, the government is striving to do its level best. You know, if you see the expansion of education within the last one or two decades, uh, it is very, very, very big. You know, from where, what it were, 12,000, now we have about 40,000 schools, primary schools. And over 20 million primary school kids are in a school. Still, four, 4 million kids are out of school. This is a very big number. And the country is uh, devoting I mean, the lion's share of its uh, public resource to education. The, the total public expenditure, 25% of total public expenditure goes to education. But you know, the government is trying to approach the problem through only conventional way, through expanding school. Uh, like um, our famous runner, Haile Gebrselassie, how many of you know about Haile Gebrselassie? He broke over 18 records, marathon and long distance. Once, once upon a time when he was asked about marathon, uh, he was asked which part of marathon is the most difficult. You know, he answered, the last stretch is the most difficult. Not the 42 kilometer, but the last stretch is the most difficult. So when we bring this lesson to education, the four million kids are the most difficult to, to bring them to school because these kids have several problems which keep them behind. Unless we tackle those problems, we cannot bring these children to school by just mere creating a school or constructing a school in their vicinities. There are multiple problems. So like, like the girl uh, you, you see here in the, in the slide, there are many kids who are supposed to be in school, but not are, are in school due to mainly poverty. So here comes the speed school to just address such problems uh, through a comprehensive approach. Leslie has been discussing um, very well about the speed school approach, which has a very comprehensive model. Because, as I said, 
just providing a mere education wouldn't solve the problem of out-of-school kids because there are a number of barriers that prevent children from coming to school. One of the major barriers is a poverty level. So ma uh, mothers are not in a position to send their children. They cannot cover education costs, some of indirect education costs, not direct education costs. So we introduced a model which addresses all this problem, like um, economically empowering the mothers so that they can be in a position to, to cover the cost of their children, mm, and also strengthening the school, the recipient schools. At the end of the day, these children will go and join. And also the speed school classes, which is a very interactive, activity-based, and also uses accelerated, condensed curriculum uh, so that the children can learn very fast because these are older kids from 9 to 14 years old. Uh, you know, in Ethiopia, starting from five years, children uh, start taking responsibilities, responsibilities of uh, taking care of cattle, taking care of so many sheep or goats. So child takes responsibility starting from five years. We wouldn't call them children, but we don't have other language. We, we have to call them children. So unfortunately, our CV doesn't include that because our experience starts from five years. Uh, so how, how would a school start teaching children counting from, from zero? when they have already managed so many activities, so many responsibilities. They are already counting numbers. The only thing they, they don't know is how to symbolize number. So we use accelerated learning method through which we can acceleratively move the children to, uh, to their age mates. Uh, we start from where they are. We start from what they know. That is the secret of the, the model. So during this time, um, we were able to reach over 100,000 former out-of-school kids. Former out-of-school kids now joined to conventional school system. And 90% of them persisted in the school system. This is very big, big achievement because in our conventional system, one every five student drops out. But speed school students persist in the school, 90% of them persist in school, and also performing very well in their academics. That is big success. And this is uh, confirmed by different scientific researches, including university sciences, Sussex University research, and also the government data uh, researches. And uh, many appreciate the program. So we asked ourselves, so what? So uh, this is just a tip of an iceberg. Because in a country where there are 100 million people, where there are 4 million out-of-school kids, just impacting the life of only 100,000, it means nothing. So should we continue doing this, or should we encourage the government to take it up? Because at the end of the day, it's not us, because it's the government, the main duty bearer, in terms of providing education to its citizen. So we are there to show innovative ways and encourage the government to take it up. So we, we've started influencing the government. That was not an easy task. It was a very, a very difficult task. I will tell you why. The first two questions we, we, we had to answer, is it impactful? Yes, it is impactful, because it changed so many lives. Over 100,000 kids already joined primary school and showed a very high and a remarkable achievement in their education. It's really remarkable. And many poor families could send their children to school without without suffering a lot. And also many mothers, the economic status of many mothers improved as the help of this program and were able to send their children sustainably to school. 
So this is impactful, yes. Is it scalable? Sometimes when NGOs start some innovation, they start with a very capital intensive kind of intervention at the end of the day, which cannot be taken up by the, a poor, poor governments like Africa. So that's not scalable. But from the outset, we thought about the cost we thought about the relevance of the program to the nation, and we thought about the application, whether the capacity of the government can take this up or not. So we proved that this program is really scalable. Then started pushing towards the scaling. Most important thing is evidence. As I told you, we have a university research. Would that be enough? Do you think many people read university scientific researches and understand? That language has to be changed into a practitioner's language. University research is it's not attractive for, for many people, for many practitioners to read and understand. So we had to change the language in such a way that any practitioners can understand. In the first place, practitioners do not have time to read a very bulk kind of document, a cumbersome document. They want to read very short message. So we developed a kind of two pagers, which reflect the main results of the scientific evidences and disseminated those evidences within the country. The second thing is customization. Customization. You know, one size does not fit all. Something what works here may not work there. You know, in Ethiopia, the speed school calendar is a very intensive calendar. Children learn for six days a week, seven hours a day. Elsewhere, this may not be practical because, you know, the Ethiopian Tourism Commission uh, motto says 30 months of sunshine. We, we do have sunshine all over the year. 13 months of sunshine, and sometimes we joke uh, only 12 months of salary. 13 months of sunshine, but 12 months of salary. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, we have a lot of sunrise, so children can learn, learn in extensive calendar, but this cannot be the case everywhere. So in some places, uh, people may not accept the Saturday classroom due to various reasons. So we had to customize. We had to reschedule or redesign the curriculum to fit into the available time. In some places, you know, uh, children may not learn for seven hours a day due to various reasons. So we have to customize. We have to customize that. If we, if we take the, when we take this program to Uganda, the Ethiopia and the Uganda curriculum system are two different things. The Ethiopian curriculum is subject-based. The Ugandan curriculum is thematic-based. So we had to customize to fit into the Ugandan reality. So customization and uh, making evidence more understandable was the first step that we, need, uh, we had to take. And then, you know, when we have some people who are more uh, inspired by the program, so we had to use those people as cadres. To your surprise, these people were the first resistant people when we started the program. You know, sometimes people who resist at the beginning could serve you as a very good cadre later on when they take it up. So you have to use such kind of people to persuade others. So you have to find uh, the best entry point, where to start your scaling. You, you cannot start scaling everywhere. You have to start in a place where uh, there are people who are more enthusiastic than others. So we, we, we picked that place, which was in the northern part of Ethiopia. So we started scaling, uh, scaling there. In the first year, the government, regional government, was willing to finance 32 schools, 32 schools using this model. So that was a big start for us. So following that year, other regions start to pick up. And in the, in the 2018, 
there were 110 schools fully financed by the government using this model. In 2019, it's almost doubled. 262 schools are being financed, fully financed by the government, adopting this model. So our goal is gradually the government adoption is growing as our intervention reduces. So it's going like this way. So the, the most important thing is uh, we have realized the missing elements. When the interest and the demand is growing, we were not ready to really provide the support because we didn't have a very organized and um, consolidated toolkit to give to other people. So we had to develop a toolkit. Uh, and the second one is just know what to scale up. There is two different things, the method or the model. By the model, it means scaling up whatever we do as it is. By the method means some people may be interested in some element of the speed school approach, then they will be ready to, to take that element. So we have to uh, differentiate between the two. And the third one is focusing on institutionalization. It's, uh, I mean, when the government finance schools, that should not be the end of the story. The most important result is system change. If there is something reflected in the policy, if we are able to influence the curriculum, the national curriculum, if we are able to influence the national plan, that is institutionalized. That is system change. It's not a mere just financing some schools. So we make sure that government uh, really committed to uh, institutionalize the adoption process, and we did so. And finally, uh, the lessons, the major important lessons and the takeaway from this scaling up process. Um, the major number one uh, lesson is a scaling up should be think over, thought over from the outset, not in the middle. From the outset, we have to make sure that our program is scalable or not in terms of cost, in terms of approach, in terms of the required human resource should be scalable. That should be considered. And the second one is evidence. You, we have to produce scientific evidence, empirical evidence, and that has to be correctly communicated to different audience in such a way that they can understand. That is the most important uh, message. And the third one is using witnesses, strong witnesses, enthusiastic people, within the government or outside, then those people will help us to push our agenda. So that is also a very important lesson. Another important lesson is, uh, know that the major duty bearer is government. We are not the major actors. There are a number of actors who are engaged in the same kind of activity. Many organizations would like to to push the government to scale up their program. But few succeed. Why do you think so? Because, because we usually don't appreciate what governments are doing. We, we usually want to uh, replace what the government has changed instead of complementing. So we have to start by appreciating. We have to start by appreciating and recognizing what the government is doing then tell them this is just a compliment to whatever you're doing. Instead of just seeking a complete upside down kind of change. So that is a very important uh, lesson. We used a kind of appreciative inquiry. The, the, the other one is customization. I have already said customization is a very important thing. Wherever you take it, it should be customized to the reality. Uh, now, uh, bilateral, multilateral organizations are taking, like UNICEF, is trying to use this model for migrant people, internally displaced people, with customization, with a lot of customization. So we have to accept change. We have to be willing to accept change. That is also one key 
important message. The last one is in focus on institutionalization. Focus on institutionalization. So last but not least, my dream is that every child who deserves to be school should come to school and get a quality education so that education pays off. Education discharges its promises. So that is my biggest wish. I hope we, we will uh, realize that dream with the support and help of all stakeholders, including uh, Supercell, who has been generously supporting our program, uh, including the Ethiopian government and other partners, including you who are contributing your ideas to the growth of our program. Thank you so much. I have one short question, Alameyu, to you. Uh, like a 30-second 30, 30 answer to a difficult question. Uh, how do you feel, because your strategy is really interesting for me, which means that even though it's, it's your baby or your team, you've been working hard for ages and so on, to kind of like give that to government. Mm -hmm. Are you sort of like worried is that they are making changes or whatever, or is it only for you about the child and, and scaling? Because that's not normal, is that you create something and then you give it to a government. <laughs> that, that is a tricky question. Uh, you know, uh, as I said, uh, we have to first admit that the government has responsibility, uh, especially basic education. Education is the number one responsibility of any government, to provide basic education to its citizen. So we have to um, challenge our own ego. So we, we don't have to keep a program for ourselves. It's, it's about the children. It's not about us. Whatever innovation we created, it's about the children. So what, what we're looking for is um, opportunities that more children get benefited. You know, if, if we are implemented, if we are keep on raising funds and try to address this problem forever, we may not reach, you know, even one million uh, children over 10 years. So the only and the best solution is to bring the government on board, to make sure that the government takes this up and uh, influence the mainstream education system. So we are focusing on system change rather than show up and just a showcase of our program and just uh, get the appreciation. Uh, that, that is our uh, ambition. That's why we are yeah. successful in terms of... Thanks so much. And, and like mentioned, I was really impressed with, with what, what he... What <laughs>